Oh, uh, I hope you have something great to wear tonight, because we're going to a party. A party? I... I want to introduce you to someone. Last time, we were looking at how Lacan describes the structure of a subject, uh, particularly through uh, looking at Lacan's formulation of what metaphor is, as well as uh, schema L, which is found in his seminar on the Bourlogne letter by Edgar Allan Poe. And we're going to be building off of that, especially because now we are seeing how is it that this psychoanalytic subject we've been talking about all the way since the first episode has been able to be formalized in this uh, Lacanian algebra, is what we can start calling it. So today we're going to be turning back again to the question of metaphor, build on it a little bit more. And uh, we are also going to be looking at topology, and I figured... Uh, this this one thing is a little bit beyond me to some extent still uh, particularly because I'm not a mathematician so uh, I have to be very mindful of how Lacan talks about it that's one of the major criticisms of Lacan but I can say enough by just pointing towards the Google definition of it and we're gonna find it too and we're gonna take these as, at a general face value to work with because I, I think that will be enough for what Lacan is trying to do and in the sense how he's using this particular form of study. So topology. The first one is the study of geometric properties and spatial relations unaffected by the continuous change of shapes or figures. The second one is the way in which constituent parts are interrelated or arranged. And we've seen this to some extent before in um, how is it that schema L builds off of some of the basic structures of this uh, this subject as imaginary to symbolic to real. So it'll be important to understand how Lacan is using this and that's why we're turning back to, to metaphor because Lacan works with a metaphoric use of structure and topology to talk about the subject of psychoanalysis that, that discussion that has been going all the way back to the first uh, session of this. And we'll see that this metaphoric use of structure and topology will turn out to be the subject itself, that the structure and topology is the subject itself. So we're gonna be working towards that. Let us begin by considering the notion of metaphor in poetry. And I've noted this in a uh, variety of conversations or uh, writings I've done. So I'm just going to take a, a lot from that. If metaphor can be the atomic unit of building meaning in poetry, then metaphor is the very situating of the site for building meaning. So in a sense, when metaphor occurs, we open up a space that we can be considered meaningful and upon which we're building how is it that we define things that mean to us. But this metaphoric space that is opened up as meaningful and for the building of determinate meanings comes with a unity of oppositions worth noting. For example, when poetry is embodied through the finite poet, the poet is a site of the tension between the open loose capacity to express and its incapacities. In the act of crafting a metaphor, the poet gives body and performatively admits to this humiliating humility that sustains poetry. For a metaphor is literally saying the wrong thing to get at something besides what is being said. That we basically taken this in principle, this whole way of explaining psychoanalysis that started with mythologizations and narratives around it. So we explored metaphor so far. I once just stayed at saying that the poet humbly turns towards the poverty of in language, in languages lack, into the wealth of language. That this was almost like a one-way relationship. But at this point, and I think I have mentioned it before, I am nevertheless open to the possibility and actuality of the opposite, insofar as whatever meaning is done can also be undone. In other words, the poet can also humiliatingly take the wealth of language and sink it down to a deprived state from the metaphoric site, that everything that can be built up from meaning can be brought down. For the psychoanalyst in the psychoanalytic experience, 
this notion of metaphor ski as the setting of psychoanalysis, its functions and its functions through the side of speech, where the analysis may miscommunicate or misrecognize as well as communicate and recognize in talking around what is the thing that impelled us, that impelled them to analysis. In the work of Jacques Lacan, we find a formu formulation of the situation uh, which we've seen before, so I'm putting it here again. Is it, this is the structure of metaphor. For Lacan, this formalizes something key to the psychoanalytic experience. So I'm here repeating a formulation, namely that in the relationship of speech, particularly particular to analysis, the analysand is that not over what they mean in talking to the analyst between what can be spoken out, which is re represented with the S with the lower number one, in the act of speaking, which is the dollar sign. In other words, the subject of psychoanalysis is split between what it, it can say about itself and what it fails to say. In a sense, we've seen before how Lacan takes on the Cartesian formulation of I think, therefore I am, but changes it, displaces the space of the subject. Uh, so let's put that formulation here again. I think where I am not, therefore I am where I do not think. I'm not whenever I am the play thing of my thought. I think of what I am where I do not think to think. However, Besides this formulation of the structure of metaphor, Lacan invites us to reconsider the notion of the signifier. For in metaphor, the signifier pertains the very side of signification and meaning alongside with particular meanings themselves. In the case of S1, S1 comes to be the master signifier that acts as the anchoring point of identification and representation for the subject to itself. Whenever I'm engaging, let's say, with a linguistic community, I signify myself in the act of speaking because I can only communicate with people by entering that space of communication as already signifying, as meaning something. Insofar as the psychoanalytic subject enters the discursive space or site of speech in analysis, the Lacanian subject has a signifier as its way into the discursive matrix, only representative to other subjects as a signifier just as other subjects are integrated, only recognizable and intelligible to it as signifier. To this extent, the split of the subject in the structure of metaphor amounts to alienation being the condition of the possibility of identification, representation, and inevitably analysis. For the psychoanalytic subject is inaugurated in one and the same move that it is distanced from itself in self-differentiation. When I only take myself out, that's exactly where the problem begins. The point of the structure metaphor is crucial, as the speech of the analysand as self-narrational nevertheless pertains the articulation and untangling of desire. In breaking down what Lacan refers to as the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real, we can observe different moments of this self-narrative as it unfolds. For instance, in the imaginary and the mirror stage, we can suppose that the declarative sentence I want this supposes the phenomenological insight that consciousness is apparently transparent to itself. But as we've seen, uh, when we introduce the symbolic and the big other, this consciousness is only apparent to itself through another, so it's not transparent to itself, and that's what the real teaches us. We see the sort of disconnect that we, uh, where the real becomes apparent in a sort of uncanny sense, because consciousness is apparent to itself only through another. Arriving at truth took semblance, obscuration, and forgetting. In other words, the metaphor is at the core of psychoanalytic truth and the tension of the real, which is only possible insofar as the symbolic and the imaginary are also in operation. In these movements, we're trying to set up 
the structure of the subject of psychoanalysis in such a way that this structure lends itself to different reconfigurations, and that's how we come back to topology. How is it that the, what is essential to this discussion remains in different sorts of diagrams or formulations that are a way of conceiving of its space? To give one such example, we can go back again to Schema L from Lacan's lecture on Edgar Allan Poe's The Purloined Letter. So, if one were to notate in Schema L, this would be the following. The imaginary is in Schema L and is noted as the relationship between an ego and another, so between the A and the A with the apostrophe. The big other and the symbolic are noted in Schema L as the big A or the big other. And the real is noted as S, which in French translates to le so. And in English, though it is mostly known as id, its more proper expression would be the unconscious as it, which we discussed before. But we also find that later Lacan turned to other kinds of figures to provide a topological structure of the subject of psychoanalysis. For example, let's consider the torus. And this is a ring figure of a three-dimensional object formed by taking a cylinder and joining, joining the two ends together. If we turn towards the figure of the torus and take into account that the, uh, the subject of psychoanalysis is a decentered subject that is not transparent to itself, then what is at first a metaphoric expression insofar as the center of gravity of both structural objects falls aside them is nevertheless the subject itself. So again, the excess of the subject is formulated by both Lacan and Slavoj Žižek as extimacy, a problematization of the notions of internal and external insofar as the most intimate core of the subject is nevertheless found outside it. For the real is just as much in as it is out. Not only is the outside in, in, internal to the figure, but the figure also holds an internal outside. And it is in this sense that the question of the unconscious in psychoanalysis is not merely an inner psychic system, but rather an intersubjective, eccentric, and uncanny sort of configuration. For instance, if we consider the subject in relationship to the symbolic, the uncanny and strange subject faces itself in a roundabout way where the other is something strange to me, although it is at heart me. So running into twists and turns with itself, the Lacanian subject of psychoanalysis trans transverses fant its fantasy, both inside and outside in continuity, such that it is neither quite inside out nor outside in, for the oppositions are bound together into an uncanny unity of its analytic experience. In the following figure, we are going to turn towards the Mobius strip, a figure which seems as if it has two sides, but in reality it has only one. This pertains to the subject of psychoanalysis in that much like the partial aspects of the subject as it tries to apprehend itself, at any one point or passing vignette, two sides can be clearly distinguished, but when the whole strip is transversed, it turns out that they are actually continuous. And lastly, we can consider Lacan's discussion of Borromean knots. This figure consists of a minimum of three threads or rings interlocked with each other in such a way that no two of the three rings are linked with each other through a simple link. But nonetheless, all three are connected. At first, the Borromean knot is a metaphoric description of the three registers of the structure of the subject of psychoanalysis as imaginary, symbolic, and real. Through the theory of knots, Lacan stresses the interrelations of these three different registers, how they are subject to each other, and how this being subject to each other is without hierarchy or the priority of any one register. 
to give a tangible description of how we have talked about this so far, as it pertains to the subject of psychoanalysis. When we have talked about the analyson running into linguistic knots in self-narration, this tension is articulated in the morphological place of the Mor uh, Borromean structure. So by morphological place, I mean distortions or modifications of the space while seeing what has that the, their properties are sustained or reconceived in, in just a, a change in the figure. So here I'll provide a few different examples and, that we can find in Lacan's uh, se a seminar on feminine sexuality and the limits of knowledge. Through the Voromian knot, the ego is not merely the pure imaginary, as both it has symbolic aspects and real aspects. However, the notion of the no Voromian knot in the Lacanian subject had another addition, the symptom which rather than dissolving the subject, it adds a fourth ring holding the subject together. But this ring, which holds the subject together, is also constantly under the possibility of being undone and thereby undoing the rest of the stru structure, thus bring about uh, a theorization of the psychotic subject. The symptom does and holds the subject together as much as it may be undone by its undoing, which Lacan elaborates through the structure of psychotic speech, as in the case of Judge Shreva. Uh, so here I quote, and again, uh, sorry about my bad German, Nunch will ich mit, sie sollen namlich. Uh, so these are just cases of interrupted sentences, and what they're supposed to reflect, a broken chain of semiosis where its subject is, um, and I'm quoting here from Lacan's 20th century, so again, where its subject is just the requirement of a sentence, which is such that one of its links, when missing, sets all the others free, that is, withdraws them from the one, so from a un unitary trait, from being the one, being one. For instance, in an earlier seminar dedicated to the psychosis, Lacan elaborated on how the clinical structure of psychosis is distinct from that of neurosis or perversion. For psychosis pertains the question of foreclosure, which we'll define a little bit more, whereas neurosis is characterized by repression and perversion is characterized by disavowal. However, the clinical structure of psychosis as a question of foreclosure can inform us about the structural space that the symptom sustains. The structure of psychosis is characterized by a faulty symbolic sy function or system, for the foreclosure is a foreclosure of the par par parental function as such, which is rendered as a whole or a lack in the symbolic. However, due to the intersubjective nature of the symbolic and the big other, the symbolic is not integrated as such, but as the real, which characterizes itself as psychotic hallucinations or delusions, how is it that these injunctions of the symbolic nevertheless appear but are rendered into another form of apparition. For through the psychotic undoing of the subject, the symbolic is reduced into a vignette, image, where the unconscious is present, but not functioning. So here we're turning to a few image images where um, we can see the symptom as the knot with the sign of sigma. And when that, that uh, knot is removed, then the imaginary and the real lose a cohesive tie to the symbolic. So. If we look at the Borromean knots, but the ones that include the symptom as sigma, we can start observing how the, uh, the symptom sustains this relationship to the symbolic, moving from these different uh, figures. It is ultimately with the symptom 
where we see a radical change in Lacan from using topology metaphorically to stressing that that topology is the structure of the subject itself. For the symptom is unsayable because meaning is integrated into the subject at the intersection between the symbolic and the imaginary. And therefore, even though the symptom may find itself expressed by linguistic means in a roundabout way, the symptom is nevertheless beyond limit and as an excess function besides the symbolic and the imaginary. And this we can find elaborated on in uh, the sem uh, seminar uh, 23. Not only does the symptom pertain an excess over and beyond meaning, but it also teases the a metaphoric figure as topology as such. For it is beyond the intuitions of the imaginary, first of all. Towards the end of seminar uh, 20, 20, the one on feminine sexuality and the limits of knowledge, Lacan teasingly repeats his famous phrase, the unconscious, structured like a language which is in its repetition that reveals something about the structure of metaphor. For the like that is between structured and language amounted to a metaphoric expression of the unconscious itself. And now that the unconscious also exceeds meaning and linguistic expression, this like of the unconscious is structured like a language this like takes more meaning due to its excess, and its excess is in that the metaphor was the structure itself. In this study of the symptom to true topology, it becomes evident that the space of the symptom is non-intuitive and that to comprehend the subject of psychoanalysis requires a break with intuition, nevertheless uh, guided by intuitions as if they were fingertips of the figures of the thinkable. We did this by working through a misguided intuition in the case of myths of psychoanalysis. For again, the access to psychoanalysis takes a form, form of roundabout way or a detour. The kind of space that the subject of psychoanalysis then takes up is non-intuitive or not immediately intuitive in fact, after a series of discussions over topology and the theory of knots, Lacan goes as far as to conclude that, and I'm quoting here from Seminar 20th, a space is not intuitive. A space knows how to count, no much higher than we do. And to return to a space, it seems to be a part and parcel of the unconscious. Therefore, and with this we're going to be concluding this discussion, this is not just a metaphoric study of the subject of psychoanalysis, but also a study of the structure of the subject and a study of a structure itself.